This podcast and content posted by Dr. Judith Joseph is presented solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from this podcast or website is at the user's own risk. It is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, psychotherapist, or other qualified professional diagnoses or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical or mental health condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Dr. Sia is an award-winning content creator with a community of over 3 million followers. Dr. Sia educates South African communities about intimacy health, and he's won several awards because he talks about things that most people are ashamed to talk about. Dr. Sia knows that most patients will not read medical guidelines, but they will get their health from online influencers on social media. So he teamed up with Andy Pattinson at the World Health Organization to become a digital health consultant. That's where he recruited me along with other qualified healthcare workers to educate the public about health issues using social media. Dr. Sia, Andy, and I worked together at the United Nations General Assembly Week events this year on several panels, and we talked about supporting health professionals to use digital platforms to spread accurate information. But we also addressed topics like burnout and depression in healthcare professionals. I wish I had your book back then so I can learn about high function depression. Unfortunately, I learned it through the psychiatrist and then I educated myself on it. It's good that I learned and I'm taking better care of my mental health. Yeah, two things can be true. You can be fully functioning, doing amazing things, and also you can struggle. On this episode of The Vault, Dr. Sia shares how he was masking high-functioning depression with productivity, and we discuss ways that he used to heal. Dr. Sia, thank you so much for entering The Vault today. I'm so excited to see you again. I just saw you not so long ago at the United Nations events, and you are this like world-renowned physician, uh, you practice in South Africa, you create content that reaches millions of people, especially people who are underserved, and you just break things down in such a fun and creative way that people feel motivated and inspired to take care of their health. So thank you for coming uh, on the vault today. And we were just saying about how New York has a special place in your heart right now, right, from your visit. <laughs> First of all, thank you for having me. It was an honor meeting you in New York, and as I said, I've fallen in love and can't wait to come back. Well, you, we had such this, like a phenomenal week. We were like on stage at these United Nations events. Sometimes we were followed by prime ministers and it was like so many pinch me moments. Like, like how did we even get here? And I think everyone would really love to hear your story about how you went from being a physician, working directly with patients to then having this massive social media following of millions of people from creating health content. So please tell us about your journey. So everything started at the beginning of the pandemic. It was an escape from the stresses of, the, of being on the front line. So I joined TikTok because my daughter encouraged me to do so. And we started making videos together. And it wasn't until like two, three months later when I started making medical content. And that's mainly because I was getting 20 to 30 WhatsApp messages from friends, family, some colleagues even, what are symptoms of COVID? Am I having COVID? What is the treatment? Can I take this? Can I take that? So instead of answering all these messages, I was like, you know what? I'm going to make a video on TikTok and you all can go watch it. So that's how it all started. Start making videos about COVID, about HIV, which is the epidemic here. And these videos got lots of traction. People wanted more, people started following. And within six months or so, I was at 100 or 200,000 followers. I was verified. WHO messaged me saying, I'm doing a great job and I must continue. And I was like, who is trolling me? It must be one of my friends, can't be WHO. I checked the person and it was legit. It was actually Andy who messaged me and that gave me lots of encouragement. I continued. I was mentioned in British Medical Journal, uh, Huffington Post, uh, for my work on TikTok. And I think these are all testaments to the power of social media. You can reach millions and millions of people. I mean, saving a life, I don't think anything beats that feeling, but to be able to educate millions 
uh, with one video is such a rewarding feeling. So yeah, and as, as I said earlier, sex education is not a thing everywhere. There are countries who don't have sex education. I get messages from teenagers who, who are like ask, I kissed my boyfriend, my pregnant. So obviously you have to be very empathetic, very understanding. Um, not everybody gets taught these things in school. So, and these are the things that fuel my passion to continue just to educate about the most basic sexual and reproductive health, like periods. When do they start? How long do they last? Um, how can you get pregnant? How morning after pill works? So yeah, and it's been such a rewarding journey for the past few years. Yeah, you know, I, when you said that at the World Health Organization UN events, I was just like, wow, like, you know, we take for granted our education and, and the fact that we have access to information, but there are many people in the world who still think that certain um, behaviors can lead to certain outcomes that are just not rooted in science. And you have a way of explaining it without sounding like patronizing or like you're talking down to people, very relatable. As someone who treats patients and who hears all these questions and sees them in your in your feed, what are like three things that people believe about sex that is just not true, but they believe it and it creates a lot of fear and anxiety for them? So few of the things that people really believe in, uh, one of them is the pull out method. People think pull out method is the safest method in the world. Uh, nobody heard about pre come or pre ejaculate, for example. <laughs> and uh, actually pull out method has around 70 to 80% efficacy, so it means out of every 10 people, two get pregnant. So, and this is, I think, one of the main problems we are facing in South Africa is that last year or the year before, we had more than 90,000 teenage pregnancies. And I truly believe lack of sex, sex education, it's one of the main contributors to this thing that people think that if you don't ejaculate inside, means all is fine and you'll be great which is sadly not. And it's like a basic information that not many people know of. Another one, it's about morning after pill. People think if you take your morning after pill, good to go. Morning after pill works, one of the ways that it works is that by delaying uh, ovulation. So if you've already ovulated, it's not gonna work. Uh, and that's the thing that basic information that many don't know. If your weight above certain BMI, the efficacy goes down. Um, so yeah, these are two of the ones that I, I come across a lot. Another one is that we have lots of period myths in South Asia or East Southeast Asia. I get a lot of questions. The one of the one that I got lately, I mean recently, it was from a person asked me, if I shower while I'm having periods, will I die? I obviously didn't laugh or anything because I've read about this myth. And I think it's common that side of the world. And they, and I said, of course not gonna die. How old are you? She was I think 13, 14 years old. Uh, basic information. The other thing is that also some countries in Asia, they put menstruating women in huts. So not at home, somewhere, in a hut alone for days because they are menstruating. And these people go through, I think somebody even passed away in the few, that was in the news a few years ago. They get, I mean, assaulted and many more. So breaking these basic myths, it's I get with lots of backlash because how can you tell me my grandma was wrong? Whether telling them period is not dirty or you can still get pregnant if you have unprotected sex during pregnancy, during uh, periods. It's, it's just, or even if your hair is wet and you go outside, you're not gonna get cold. That's not the reason you get cold. They're like, no, my granny told me this and how dare you? So I get lots of backlash, but I know deep inside that someone back there will do their own research and get educated and take better health decisions for themselves yeah and, and sexually transmitted you know, infections there's so much shame right some of some exactly. some of my most difficult um 
cases to treat and uh, related to depression and anxiety were related to people having a lot of shame around sexually transmitted infections and not feeling like they could share it. So you're like carrying around the shame with you and you just, you don't want to talk about it because the stigma, you're ashamed. You think people will treat you differently. So you're doing it alone. So I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of overlap. One can lead to the other, right? And then people who have mental health shame, they may cope by partnering with people and you know engaging in sexual behaviors that maybe they wouldn't have if they had addressed you know their mental health issues. So I think the two are connected. What are the top three things you've seen in terms of how mental health plays a role in sexually transmitted infections? So I was thinking that mental health and sexual health, they both face a lot of stigma and sexual health problems can lead to mental health. Like if you have premature ejaculation or erectile dysfunction can affect your mental health. And at the same time, if you have like depression or anxiety can lead to sexual health issues like decreased libido. As you mentioned, the first one would be if you're having mental health issues, it will most probably lead to risky sexual behavior, unprotected sex, multiple partners. Uh, number two would be if you're having an STI, you're most probably facing stigma and shame, which can affect your mental health um, more. Uh, in South Africa, we have one of the highest numbers of HIV patients in the world. And when I worked in the HIV unit, one of the conditions to start HIV is that you need to, I mean, now we start them first, but then they have to go through three sessions of um, counseling. I mean, rates of mental health issues are already high and you add HIV to it, it makes it more complicated. HIV is probably one of the easiest conditions to treat. It, you just have to take your one tablet every day and you're gonna have a normal life expectancy. That's why the problem starts when patients are not ready to start uh, their treatment and they take it and they stop and they take it and they become resistant and the complications arise. So that's why when we start, we need to make sure that they are mentally aware, mentally prepared to take uh, the treatment for life treatment. Hopefully in the future, we're gonna have a cure. And as I mentioned, you take your one tablet and you can have a normal life expectancy. It's one of the easiest conditions, in my humble opinion, to treat. For example, if you have diabetes, you have to do lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, go on tablets day and night, then insulin, do screenings. It's, it, you cannot even compare it to the one tablet a day that you take it. Yeah, I mean, by creating content, it's actually making our lives easier because we're spreading the correct information. And hopefully, you know, down the line, people access the correct care rather than self-soothing in other ways that may actually add on more medical conditions. And I'm so glad that I met you because when you um, messaged me over TikTok, I thought it was like, there's no way this is the World Health Organization. They don't, they don't message. And it was like, oh, it was legit. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm working with the World Health Organization as a Fides influencer. But, you know, Tell us more about this program, because I don't think a lot of people know about it and why it's so important for healthcare professionals to be on social apps. I know that a lot of my followers are, are healthcare professionals. And, you know, initially when I started my journey, it was it was a bit looked down on. Like they were like, how do you have time for this? Um, you know, like, aren't you worried about what people will think? But we really do need more healthcare professionals online. So tell us about this whole process of working with FIDES and, and why it's so important to have healthcare professionals as social media influencers and content creators. So this all started, I think 2020 or 2019 when Andy invited me, another two healthcare creators were on TikTok. I think one was a nurse or is a nurse and the other one was a scientist and basically asked us, how can WHO support you guys? I was like, I need help with my content, with my research. I spend, even though my videos were like 12 seconds, there are still 12 second videos. I spent five, six hours of research. And imagine you're already burned out, exhausted, and you have to do all that research. So 
that was one issue. The other issue, which other complain, is that they need protection. They need to know how to deal with trolls, uh, especially with the misinformed or anti-vax, if you want to call them. It was, it was not easy, especially that you are new and then you have thousands of people attacking you. It it wasn't easy to deal with. I mean, now you obviously matured through time and you know what to do. But at that time, that was issue. And I was like, if somebody can tell us, hey, how are you? Are you okay? I think like a moral support. And that's what we do in Fidis. I mean, Fidis started then. We were around like 100 or so creators. What WHO would be like, these are the latest news about COVID, latest research. You want to go go post about it great you don't want it's also great so that helped reduce time of time of like we spending creating content i joined andy's team i think um end of last year oh and just to explain fidis is a network of healthcare influencers that fight misinformation and also raise awareness so basically we are the trusted voices online and how can WHO support us is by giving us talking points it's a let's say breast cancer awareness week instead of me going spending hours and hours and hours of research to make sure my content is like up to standard WHO will give you these are, these are the talking points latest stats you want to use it great so that is one way that we support and they brought me in because they wanted someone who is also a creator and I, because I know the challenges that we've been through so I can help with those things. So we have two groups of uh, creators in Fidi. So one are the established ones and established creators and the other ones are like the beginners. So I have a dedicated WhatsApp group where I give them feedback on their content, try to upskill them, give them master classes. Um, give them feedback on their videos, how can they improve. Uh, so it's, it's this very rewarding experience because when I was starting this, I never had anyone telling me anything. It was like a lonely road, especially in South Africa. It is still a kind of a, like a lonely road because we don't have many creators in South Africa who are doing medical education. So that was one reason I was brought in and also to vet and recruit, uh, I mean, I recruited my friends, which was great. And then when I was vet and I'm vetting, I need to look at the credentials, look at the content, make sure they're up to standard. And uh, yeah, organizing master classes. We were 100 or so members. Now we are over 800 onboarded members from plus 50 countries. And we have another 400 500 people waiting to be vetted and be onboarded into fides and you know when you say that doctors need support i think people look at doctors as if they are in positions of authority they're protected they know better because we know the science so we should have no problems but i think people would be shocked to know that doctors have some of the highest rates of depression highest rates of suicide highest rates of substance abuse because it is isolating, you know, once you you uh, basically delay your happiness throughout your youth because you're studying all the time. Many of us graduate with student loan debt that we have to work for decades to pay off. And then the pressure, you know, of having to see patients, potentially having lawsuits, because um, we're not perfect. Um, and then all of the demands that especially if you're in a very capitalist society where you have to have the right coding, the right paperwork done, the right insurance claims. It's a lot. And then if you, God forbid, you try to start your own family, then you have to add that whole other set of responsibility. So when you see a physician content creator or a healthcare content creator that is doing this, it, this is not like for money. You know, this is a really passion and a way for us to be connected. So we need to support each other. And and I've gone to events for creators in the past with other plat. I work across various platforms, but I've never encountered anything quite like Fides because it's a real community. Like y'all be blowing up my WhatsApp all the time. Like we actually talk to each other. You actually deliver consistent workshops to support us. 
we problem solve together. And it's a way for healthcare professionals to not be alone in this. We, act, we become better at it because we, we benefit from each other's knowledge and experience. And it's so needed. It's just so needed. I'm so glad that it's growing. And I think more, more people need to know about it. More people need to support us. And we get trolled too. We need, we need support too. We need to keep going too. Um, I know Andy, who heads up this initiative, said that he was inspired because uh, one of his f- favorite physician content creators was going to give up because they were getting discouraged, they weren't getting supported. So we don't we don't want our healthcare professionals who are making content to give up because we're the ones that know how to actually give content based in evidence based science based in our experiences, based on our treatment failures, our treatment success. So we need to keep, you know, our content creators online. I always ask my experts like yourself, to tell me about a time when you were struggling on the inside but on the outside you were accomplishing so much and everyone thought you had it figured out they were like wow like i need to do what you're doing but you knew you were like wait if you only knew if you only knew how much i was struggling and how did you get through that if you only knew exactly if you only knew such a deep question but for me it's such a easy one to answer because i know exactly when and how i was feeling like i mean was it beginning of the pandemic? All the pandemic, the first year, uh, working on the front line. I worked in the murder capital of South Africa. I was the acting clinical manager, so I had had to put in, ensure the policies are put in, the guidelines, uh, seeing all the amount of sick, very sick patients dying in front of you. I mean, this already, working as a doctor is already not easy, and to go through that extra trauma. Plus, my free time was always making content and if the content don't go well, you get depressed, upset. Um, I mean, now I know what kind of content to create. It must be simple, digestible, clean, um, educational, entertaining. Back then, we had to obviously wear, learn the hard uh, way. So my first year or so, I reached 2 million followers. As I mentioned, WHO approached me. I was a British medical journal. Huffington Post, I was in radio stations, n- local newspapers, news articles, radios. And to be honest, I didn't celebrate much. Like when WHO messaged and having, I mean, British Medical Journal sent me the article, my jaw dropped, I was shocked. These are the highlights of my social media career. But I, so I was happy for like a minute or two and then, it's gone. I was like, maybe because of burnout, you know, like working hard, doing this. So this thing went on. Can you just give me like a, a week off so I can just rest? I wanna just, I'm, to, I'm tired mentally. So he was obviously asking me questions, took history. I realized that not only I'm not enjoying things, I'm also, my sleep is disturbed. I'm always tired with small things feel so difficult to do um so and he was like at the end you have high function depression and i was like okay how do we get rid of it how do we treat it so i think for me the main thing was being aware of the symptoms and aware of what is causing it so the fact that I was aware of like having high functioning depression and it made me take better care of myself, made me put uh, boundaries uh, at work, for example, because I will have this personality that I need to save the world. And I will go as far as possible to make sure everybody's comfortable, everybody's happy, um, protecting nurses, protecting junior doctors. And I was saying yes to everything. Like if somebody was not doing their job, they would ask me because they would knew I would do it. So I, would, I was doing everything. And this made me realize that Siamak, you cannot save the world. You need to take care of yourself first. So putting these boundaries, I was on medication for three months just to help me with my sleep and just up, give me the mood so I can do things I need to do. And I'm doing much better. And I'm grateful for that diagnosis that made me aware. I mean, I wish 
I had your book back then so I can learn about high function depression. Unfortunately, I learned it through the psychiatrist and then I educated myself on it. So it's, uh, it's been very, uh, I mean, it's good that I learned and I taking better care of my mental health. Yeah, two things can be true. You can be fully functioning, you know, doing amazing things and also you can struggle and um and i think you sharing your story is so important like i had a similar experience i was uh in 2020 giving a talk to a healthcare system telling them how to heal and to take care of themselves and i had that realization i'm a psychiatrist <laughs> imagine the shame i felt when i was like given this presentation i'm like wait a second i think i'm depressed like how did how did this sneak up on me? How did I not catch this? But that's how it happens. Anhedonia, that lack of interest, pleasure, and joy, it sneaks up on you. I call it a thief in the night. Before you know it, you just don't enjoy things. You just want to go home. You just don't want to see anyone. You get irritable. Exactly. But you don't have to do it alone. And naming it, what you described as, oh, well, now I know what this is. It, it's something called affect labeling, where if you know the name of what you're experiencing, if you know what your emotions are, that in itself is therapeutic because it decreases the amount of anxiety because like human beings do not like uncertainty. Look at 2020. We definitely don't like uncertainty, right? <laughs> a lot of our mental health took a plummet because the world was so uncertain. It's the same way with our feelings. If we don't know how we're feeling, if we can't name it, then we just feel like something's off and it's uncertain and it creates anxiety. So even naming it, even naming it, saying I have high function depression. For me, saying it out loud after that talk, I was like, I think I'm depressed. I said it out loud and I was like, wow, I feel better now because I knew something was off. <laughs> I just didn't know what, what the name was and I am a psychiatrist. So it's okay if you're listening and you don't know. And this is what you're experiencing, now you know. A lot of healthcare professionals, they'll say, say to me, well, you know, we don't wanna mitigate, we don't wanna decrease how serious depression is. Uh, you know, why use high function is not a real term. Well, the reality is that many of us will never be the person crying in bed. We'll never be the person calling out sick. Many of us, we overcompensate. When we don't feel good, we overwork. That's how we get to burnout. And I see this in healthcare professionals. I see this in nurses. I see this in doctors. I see this in people working in the hospital. It's like, rather than quitting and or saying, I need a break, it's like, well, let me just take on more because maybe that'll fix it. Maybe that'll compensate. And that's why the healers are unhealed. That's why the rates of depression are so high. That's why the rates of suicide are so high and substance abuse. So it's okay. Say it out loud and then you can do something about it. Thank you so much for coming onto the vault today. Where can we follow you? Where can we find you and keep up with all the wonderful things you're doing? Thank you for having me and thank you for the amazing work that you do online to raise awareness and break stigmas on mental health. We really appreciate you. Uh, people can find me at Dr. Sia, D-O-C-T-O-R dot S-I-Y-A on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. I have a YouTube channel, but it's very small, but I'm gonna start making long form content. So make sure to follow me there too. Oh, you're just going to blow up because your work is so amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see you and I'll see you in New York.